Chapter 1. The Disciplined Soldier Here is your first memory verse. Start working on it now. So I run with purpose in every step. 1 Corinthians 9.26 Discipline is the soul of an army. It makes small numbers formidable, procures success for the weak, and esteem to all. This is a quote by George Washington. Here there are two check boxes, one for attendance and one for the memory verse. What are these for? Are you willing to commit to being all in for this study? Then show up every week, miss a week, and you miss out on great fellowship and challenging discussions, and the platoon suffers as a whole. Make it your goal to have every attendance box checked by the end of this study. And the other blocks is self-explanatory. Begin training yourself to hide God's word in your heart. Do the hard work. Discipline. Simply say the word in today's churches, and most people, especially the guys, get turned off. Although they may not say it out loud, what most of them are thinking, and what you and I are thinking if we're really honest, is, hey, I'm at church to sing some songs I really like, get fed spiritually by the pastor, and maybe catch up with a few people while I'm here. Discipline sounds too much like hard work, and I do enough of that at my job. Besides, we just want to be about grace, not works, right? The attitude of many Christians today is that discipline is too traditional, too legalistic. It's not any fun, but if you're willing to dig deep into God's word, you'll find that the idea of discipline is firmly rooted throughout the Old and New Testaments. The Apostle Paul was one of the strongest voices for leading a disciplined life as you follow Jesus Christ. In 1 Timothy 4, 8 through 10, Paul tells us that physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle, for our hope is in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and particularly of all believers. Think about it this way. Think about an Olympic swimmer, or an NFL linebacker, or a champion marathon runner. To say that they live a disciplined life would be a serious understatement. They each spend countless hours in the gym, or on the field, or at the track, each and every week, year round. They monitor their speed, their calorie intake, their rest, every aspect of their life. With a dedication and drive that goes way beyond that of the normal, everyday guy at the office. But look again at what Paul says. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. All the time those guys spend training and working out and perfecting their bodies to be the best that they can be, that's good, but there's something a whole lot better out there to train for. Paul keeps this line of thought going in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25 once again using athletics to paint a picture for us. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. When Paul talks about disciplining his body like an athlete, the Greek word he used was doulagagio. The definition of this word is to make a slave and to treat as a slave, i.e. with severity, subject to stern and rigid discipline. That doesn't sound much like the half-hearted attempt that most of us make at Christianity, does it? The road that Paul is pointing us down in these verses is not an easy one. It will demand your time, your energy, and ultimately your life. But the prize at the end is well worth the sacrifice. The importance of that statement cannot be overlooked. The prize at the end 
is well worth the sacrifice. If you truly believe that, then you will begin to order your steps, running with purpose in every single one of them. At this point, some of you may be thinking to yourself, what have I gotten myself into? I'm really not looking for this kind of challenge in my life right now. All I was wanting was to hang out with these guys for a few weeks and then check this off my list of things I need to do to be a good person. Well, that may be the case. That might have been all you had in mind to get out of being part of the Band of Brothers. But what if God has a bigger plan for your life? Aren't you tired of sitting on the sidelines? Aren't you ready to get in the game, to make an impact, to leave a legacy? Aren't you ready to become that one that truly makes a difference in the world? The Greek philosopher Heraclitus put forth the challenge in these powerful words. Out of every 100 men, 10 shouldn't even be there. 80 are just targets. 9 are the real fighters. And we are lucky to have them, for they make the battle. Ah, but the one, one is a warrior, and he will bring all the others back. Doesn't that stir something up way down deep inside of you? Can't you feel a part of you crying out, I want to be that one? Think of Maximus in Gladiator, or William Wallace in Braveheart, men that stood their ground and made an impact. Here's a newsflash for you. You will not get there by accident. It's not just going to fall into your lap one day. The walk of a fully devoted follower of Christ is one that is intensely purposeful. You will have to learn to be disciplined. But again, the prize is worth it. As Paul said, it is an eternal prize. It is the embrace that you will get on the other side as your Savior and King wraps his arms around you and says, Well done good and faithful servant. So let's get practical. We know that there is a prize of great worth at the finish line. We know that the road to get there is a long one. And as Jesus told us in Matthew 7:14, the road is narrow and the gate is small. We also know just from living with ourselves that it's going to take a lot of discipline to keep us heading in the right direction. So how do we get started on that road? What is our first step? Teddy Roosevelt, the 26th President of the United States, said, I dream of men who take the next step instead of worrying about the next thousand steps. In other words, you'll very quickly get overwhelmed and burned out if you try to tackle everything at once. So let's take this one step at a time. Let's go once again with the analogy of athletics. With the abundance of fast food chains and 24-hour gyms, we've turned into a culture of before and after pictures. Most of us are pretty good at letting ourselves go and enjoying our pizza and beer a little too much. Next thing you know, you're looking at pictures from last summer's beach vacation, wondering how in the world did you end up looking like that. So, you get out your camera, you stand there in your gym shorts with that pathetic look on your face, and you snap your before shot. What that photograph represents is an honest, in-your-face pic of where you're at right now. There's no Photoshop editing, no fancy lighting to try to hide the imperfection. It's all there for you to see. For our purposes, the evaluation on the next page is your before photo. Your first step on this road is to take a look at each of these areas and honestly assess where you're at in each discipline. Where are you most flabby? What are some of the key areas you really want to start working out? Under each discipline, write down why you rated yourself at that level. Again, be honest in your assessment of yourself. Once you've finished your assessment and identified why you rated yourself at that level, share with your platoon what your two biggest areas of struggle are. Note, in the training for U.S. Navy SEALs, known as BUDS, Basic Underwater Demolition SEAL, each training event that the men go through is called an evolution. In each chapter of this study, you will have to go through evolutions as well. These will be your action steps, the things that should challenge you and push you to dig deeper in your walk with Jesus. In BUDS, their evolutions are taken very seriously. 
If the men skip an evolution, or go through one half-heartedly, their instructors send them off to swim in the frigid waters of the Pacific. Take these band of brother evolutions just as seriously. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with your brothers. Progress comes at the cost of personal comfort. Be disciplined. Evolution 1. This is your personal evaluation. This is essentially a worksheet. You're grading your skills 1 through 10, 1 being poor, 10 being great on the various aspects. And write down why. Uh, it's important not to forget why you graded yourself at this level. We're going to be grading ourselves in the areas of Bible study, prayer, memorizing scripture, sharing the gospel, serving others, leading at home, at work, etc., sexual purity, physical health, and fitness. Good job. You've got your before picture in front of you. You know how you stand right now in your Christian walk. So what's next? It's time to start setting some goals. It's time to get a vision for your life. Because as Proverbs 29:18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now is where you take a look into the future and you begin to envision in your mind what that after picture could look like. Where is your life falling apart right now as a result of your lack of discipline? In other words, where did it hurt the most as you did your first evolution? Is it your marriage? Your relationship with your kids? If you're single, is it your dating life or lack of it? Is it your struggle to find meaning in the mundane, the routine of life? Is it your job, your finances, your friendships? Or is it your relationship with God? Have you grown distant or disconnected? Or maybe you know deep down that you never really have had a relationship with Him. Whatever it is, it is time to get a vision for how you want your life to look at the end of this study. It's time to start exercising and stretching out those faith muscles. Ask God to show you the impossible that could happen in your life. He is the restorer of that which was lost. So don't be afraid to ask Him for those things which you thought could never happen. Not to make you feel insignificant, but seriously, who are you to say or think that God cannot or will not heal and forgive and restore and rebuild? Write down the vision for what you want your life to look like on the next page. Be bold. Be prayerful. And make it a vision that brings glory to His name, not necessarily comfort to your own life. Remember, each of these areas are not the goal. The goal is to know Jesus more intimately by stripping away more of yourself. So, we discipline ourselves to memorize more scripture. Not so we can check that box and get a pat on our back from our brothers, but in order to have a deeper relationship with Jesus by having his word hidden in our hearts. We work hard and train our bodies and minds to stop looking at porn. Not so we can have a good report to share with our spouse or our platoons, but in order to remove an area, Satan is keeping us distracted so that we can focus more of our heart on Jesus. We stop gorging ourselves on fattening food and soft drinks, not so we can look better physically or feel better about ourselves emotionally, but so that we can run this race with excellence and endurance sacrificing our bodies to expand his kingdom rather than expanding our waistline. Jesus is the point. More of him in our lives is the goal. Does that make sense? Good. Now you're ready to write down your vision. Go to the next page for Evolution 2. Evolution 2. A vision. Note, it is vitally important as you go through this evolution that you realize this. God is not in love with a future version of yourself. He sent his son to be sacrificed for your sins because he loves you right where you're at. So as you're writing down this vision for your life, don't think, God will love me more when I get there. His love for you is already greater than you could ever imagine. It is up to you to tap into the promises and the power of all that he has to offer. 
Awesome. Now let's connect those two photos. How do you get from that before pic where you stand today in Evolution 1 to the after pic of where you want your life to be tomorrow from Evolution 2? The answer is that you develop an action plan. As the saying goes, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. The Bible puts it this way in Proverbs 21, 5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. Again, being too hasty or trying to take too many steps right from the start will very quickly cause you to get overwhelmed and lose heart to finish the race. Make a plan, but think marathon as you're planning, not the 100 meter dash. Your final evolution in this chapter is this. Take a look back at those areas of spiritual discipline that you are struggling with. Now come up with at least one action step that you want to work towards in each of those areas. As an example, if you are really struggling with Bible study, your action step could be that you will commit to read the Bible at least 15 minutes for five days this next week. Then, to keep yourself accountable, you could text or email your platoon a specific verse that stood out to you each day with a short explanation of what it meant to you. Whatever your action steps are, be specific about what you're planning to do. Be intentional about including accountability with your brothers, and don't be afraid to challenge yourself. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you are capable of far more than you think. Evolution 3. Action Steps Note, the approach to leading a disciplined life as a follower of Christ has to be holistic. You can't just pick one area to really excel in and ignore the others at the same time. For example, you may really decide to dig in and get in shape physically during this study. That's awesome. But if you're dropping pounds and building muscle, but not choosing to read and study God's Word, you still lose. Make an action step for every area of discipline. Move forward as a whole, one step at a time. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Colossians 3.23 Mission Objectives Don't forget your memory verse, and be accountable to the men in your platoon for the goals that you have set. Here we have a section for prayer request. Please write down the request for all of the members of your platoon for this week, and be diligent about lifting them up throughout the week. So I run with purpose in every step. 1 Corinthians 9.26